A century from now, let no man or robot or digital personal companion embedded in the cerebellum at birth say that car and driver didn't look at this thing from every possible angle. Thus, we proceed with yet another trial of the Model S this time we compare the electric car to its direct predecessor, the hydrocarbon burning automobile, much as our forebears must have compared the first motor car to the trusty nag, which was soon to be advertised with hefty cash rebates and complimentary oat bags, so as not to be seen as blithely unappreciative of a new technology's inevitable teething issues, namely the Tesla's limited driving range and the nation's inadequate charging infrastructure. We developed a kind of handicap for the Model S the Tesla would not go up against a new car which would enjoy a de facto head start thanks to more than a century of development. Instead, it would compete against a car more in line with an electric vehicle's limitations. Hence, we looked back over automotive history for a suitable candidate. Way back, in fact. Actually, a bit further and further still, and keep it going, just a little ways more. Until we pretty much bumped into the horse again. How would the car that's heralded as the savior of humanity stack up against the humble Tin Lizzy? Now, racing a 99-year-old Ford Model T against a new Tesla Model S across one-fifth of America is really in no way fair to either car. Neither was designed to be a continent crosser. At the time of our race, the number of Tesla's high-power, quick-charge supercharger stations in our area of the country was zero, and the number of people who could rebabbit a Model T's bearings probably rounded to zilch while the Model T was undoubtedly the single greatest catalyst for the motor vehicle infrastructure, we now take for granted. It is also woefully, dangerously obsolete. Even the flow of suburban or country main streets is too fast for this 40 mph buddy. Every new car is endowed with a level of power and braking ability that leaves the T, which would prefer to just put her into town with this season's prize-winning pumpkin in back, terrifyingly out of step. We would start at the Model T Automotive Heritage Complex on Detroit's Piquette Street, where the T was designed and first built. The red brick, New England mill-style building erected in 1904 survives as a museum staffed by knowledgeable Mavins who know the correct ways to apply lapping compound and petcock sealant. With Tesla's Fremont, California, assembly plant being much too far away, the finish line would instead be electrical pioneer Nikola Tesla's old Wardenclyffe Laboratory in Shoreham, New York, on Long Island. The lab, which opened in 1902, is itself in the process of becoming a museum. Depending on the route each team chose, the race course could be as short as 682 miles but long enough that the Tesla would need to charge several times. The T drivers would most likely have to apply at least some petcock sealant. Each team determined its own route using the same start and finish lines. Both cars would have to be driven the entire distance, and each team was assigned a chase truck for spares and the haul home. But there weren't any other rules because Tesla team leader Don Sherman would just cheat anyway. The first car to Wardenclyffe would win immortality in this magazine, copies of which do, after all, go into the Library of Congress, where they're left in the restrooms for anyone to read. Six weeks prior to race, Model S team. Crack mathematician Jessica Glom of Battle Creek, Michigan, sits down at her kitchen table to predict a winner. Factoring in everything she knows, or can find on Wikipedia, about the Ford Model T, and everything she knows about her father's Tesla Model S, she concludes the following. The T will beat the S by one hour. Four weeks until the start, Model T team. Given that few presently on staff at car and driver have ever driven a Model T, the Ford team needs help. It needs a ringer if it is going to make it through the 765 miles of two laners from Detroit to Long Island. It also needs a Model T David Liepelt, a 40-year-old man who is perpetually coated in a layer of motor oil, grease, and gasoline is the best ringer one could hope for. Free T experts in three different states all independently direct us to Liepelt and the red 1915 T he's owned for half his life. He was, for almost a decade, Tasked with keeping a fleet of TS running for the tourists at Henry Ford's P into the Past, Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. Liepelt now works on steam locomotives. He is a man of the industrial age. He doesn't own a television. He, along with his friend and fellow T owner Chris Paulson, will be the core of the driving team. Our man, Daniel Pound, will perform the role of ballast and liability. 
Three weeks to grid model S team. Our strategy hinges on two simple data points. The 211-mile range C-D recorded during our road test of the Model S and the 682 MapQuest miles separating the start from the finish. Jessica's father, Fred Glom, 50, a man of the information age and owner of a technology consulting firm, has volunteered his chocolate brown Model S after seeing our petition for assistance on a Tesla owner's message board. His car is ideal because he purchased it with the P85 performance equipment, which includes the largest available 85K WH battery and the dual onboard chargers that would give us a chance at beating the T back to the brass era. We must find two recharging stops both near our direct route and spaced every 230 or so miles between Detroit and Shoreham. Further, they must deliver 240 volts at 80 amps of charging power, like the Tesla High Power Wall Connector, HPWC, that Glom has in his own garage. Simple. None of the existing Tesla supercharger stations, which offer 75-minute recharges, are close to our route. So we start investigating potential charging locations, both commercial and private. We use PlugShare, a website, an app that lists kindred spirits willing to share their electricity, see sidebar, but not all chargers are created equal. Finding a high voltage unit with the necessary amperage is challenging. With preparation time dwindling, we still haven't nailed down a suitable second charging stop. We find Tesla Roadster owners and solar enthusiasts Mark Dinchesky and Mary Herman in Danville, Pennsylvania, but their existing charger isn't compatible with the Model S. After cajoling the couple for access to their 100 amp utility pole, we hire electrician David Hayes to install the dollar 1200 HPWC that we have shipped in. Later, we'll figure out how to bury it in the all expense account. Two weeks to engine start. Voicemail of Model T team leader Daniel Pound. Daniel Pound is out of the office at the moment. If you'd like to leave a message, please press 1. 10 days until green, Model S team. To avoid surprises and check on our handyman work, we reconnoiter two-thirds of the route. On this pre-run, we fine-tune our speed versus range variables, finding that the ideal cruising speed depends on the terrain. We verify that both charge points can replenish a sapped battery pack in about five hours. This preparation also raises our familiarity with the route, diminishing the chance of a time and energy-wasting off-course deviation. It is either this or forces the Model S team members to catheterize themselves to eliminate the affront to efficiency that is the human waste system. Six days and counting, Model S team. After consultations with Tire Rack for a low rolling resistance tire recommendation, we mount a set of Michelin Primacy MXM4 radials with the tread rubber shaved to diminish energy consuming squirm. Inflating the tires to 50 psi raises sidewall stiffness into the cascade range. Wheel alignment is set to specs supplied by Tesla chassis experts. Everything non-essential, floor mats, gum wrappers, center console lint, is swept from the Model S's interior. We take the front body, seems to shave aerodynamic drag. We consider removing or folding the exterior mirrors, but ultimately leave them deployed for safety's sake. 24 hours remaining. Model T team leader punned. It seems prudent, at this point, to get some sea time in a T, so I set out to learn how to drive the thing with Liepelt in the countryside near his house. It goes well, meaning that I return from the experience only slightly more terrified of what we are about to embark on than I was before having actually driven the contraption I had incorrectly assumed was actually something resembling a car. If you ask any surviving geezer what he thinks of the Ford Model T, he will likely have fond memories of it. Such is the appreciation for this icon of Yankee ingenuity this wide-eyed, old-timey charmer. This is because the people who would have bad things to say about it all died in or under or within the general vicinity. Model TS are simple devices. But then, so are machetes. When describing what sounds like minor mechanical mishaps in Model TS, Leapelt is fond of saying things like, by all rights, that guy should have lost a foot, lost a foot. Who loses feet anymore? 9.17 a.m., Tuesday. October 15, Model T Team. We roar off on this chilly, gray October morning. Us and the non-roaring Model S actually, we don't roar either. It couldn't have looked much like a race to the 10 or so bystanders, 
mostly Piquet Museum volunteers and a couple of perplexed passers-by. Okay, fine. With a subdued whine and a clatter, we roll off. Le Mans, this ain't. 9.19 a.m., Tuesday, Model S Team. Detroit races by in a blur as electrons spew from the Tesla's batteries and go sluicing into the motor. We are winning already. Probably. 9.32 a.m., Tuesday, Model T Team. Before the race, Leepel assured us that a Model T doesn't have the beans for expressway travel, so we plan to take less speedy and much less direct roads to New York. Ford advertised a top speed of 40 mph for the 22 HP Model T. Our prohibition against expressways lasts all of 15 minutes before Leepelt wrestles the T onto the suburban Southfield Freeway and proceeds to crank along at a rate that, while sitting atop the high-mounted park bench of a seat with no belts and a gas tank directly underneath, feels entirely too fast. Later, we get a radio message from our chase truck that we hit 62 mph on a downhill grade. I holler over the wind to Leepelt. You didn't tell me this thing could do 62 mph. His reply. I didn't know it could do 62 mph. Instrumented testing later confirms Leepelt's car to have a level ground top speed of 55 mph. Model S team. Car owner Glom, at the wheel, breezes us out of Michigan and into Ohio flatlands at a steady 68 mph, arriving in Poland, Ohio, with 24 miles of range remaining. Model T Team. We are topping out at rates nearly 40% higher than the car's supposed top speed, thanks largely to an aftermarket two-speed rear axle that somehow wasn't mentioned in the pre-race meeting. This device adds a tall lever to the mix of the T's already foreign controls. Model TS have a two-speed planetary transmission operated by the leftmost of three foot pedals. Reverse gear is engaged with the center foot pedal, and some minimal braking force is applied through the right pedal. The throttle is operated by a lever mounted on the right side of the steering column. Spark Advance is controlled by a lever on the left-hand side of the column. Model S Team Our first charging stop is at Lawless Industries, a shop only 10 miles off our ideal route. Tesla Motors had introduced us to Sean Lawless, a member of the EV faithful whose enterprise builds state-of-the-art parade floats. Besides hot-rodding his own Model S, he constructs various electrically-powered vehicles ranging from commercial lawnmowers to 177 mph drag bikes. Model T Team Watching Leepelt or Paulson get the T up to speed is like watching Willy Wonka operate a fantastical machine. It is a thing of studied beauty, a sequence of crazy motions accompanied by all manner of crunching, popping, and rumbling. I am less adept and once up to speed. Simply hope to not have to stop. Despite the upgraded mechanical drum brakes Leepelt added to the rear years ago in a fit of sanity, the T doesn't really brake so much as coast to an eventual standstill. In a standard T, the only thing that happens when you press the brake pedal is that a cotton line band in the transmission feebly squeezes a drum attached to the output shaft until you collide with whatever you were braking for. Model S Team while our Model S sucks up 205 volts at 78 amps, our host whisks us to a nearby quarter-mile strip to see his electric dragster do a nearly silent disappearing act, turning in an 8.5-second, 145 mph run. Afterward, we have a relaxing lunch and take a short nap.